Hi, y'all. So the other day, JF Gary Pay, or however you say his name, uh, did a video where he was responding to some information that was leaked to him about the, the talking sessions that Kraut and T and his Muppet Farm have been having in respect to various issues on the race realism topic. And in there, it was mentioned that uh, Sandre is going to be doing a video uh, taking on my videos, uh, rebutting me, and uh, when this was brought to my attention, I got very excited, and I, I tweeted, because my Twitter was blowing up, I tweeted. I was like, <clears throat> oh God, I, I hope so, I can't wait for this to happen, because then uh, people can find out why it is that mathematicians and physicists sit atop the academic world, and chemistry students do not. It'll be a great opportunity uh, for that to occur. Well, a little while ago, uh, someone presented to me a recording of the talking session that they had about my video. Uh, the one where I was responding to Kraut directly, where Kraut and T does a not science, or however I phrased it. So Kraut, I'm going to uh, address you directly here, just uh, generally. You're in a very bad position here because, and I, I don't mean this in any in insulting kind of way, I mean, I believe you've conceded or uh, announced the fact that you dropped out of high school and then you got into night school. I presume that means night school at some college kind of level, but I don't know that for certain. Uh, this was uh, also mentioned in, uh, or a similar point was also mentioned in response to Mr. Metacor by you when he invited you and JF to a, uh, a session to talk about this, and you said that you're not an academic. That puts you in a very bad position here because you don't have the educational background generally and you don't have the analytic skills, you haven't developed the analytic skills that would be required to know when you were being shined on by those in your group and whom you were placing your trust, whether they be doing it maliciously or whether it is just because they themselves also don't know why what it is they're saying is wrong, but nevertheless they believe that it's true and they're honestly representing, they're sincerely representing to you that they believe that this is true even when it is not the case. So I'm going to be doing a series of videos talking about your session uh, where you guys are planning strategizing, brainstorming about taking me on. Uh, to the academics, uh, the various levels of scientists who are advising you, uh, to you guys I have to say, um, you're behaving, in my view, quite unethically. This guy, Kraut, is not educated in, the, in these subjects. Um, and this is why, by the way, Dr. Rand has apparently abandoned Kraut and T and crew because of all the mistakes that Kraut and T and crew have uh, made in, in these videos. Um, you are setting Kraut up for failure. You're going to tell him some things, and he doesn't know which questions to next ask in order to really make sense of it. He doesn't have the background to do that. So you are giving this guy like some little uh, facts here, some little facts there, factoids often, and I mean it in its actual, defin its actual denotation, not, the, not its common use, uh, little factoids. And then in his mind, he's going to construct models that don't relate to what it is that has been said, and he's going to put those out in public in an attempt to supposedly educate the world about the errors of people who, unlike him, are actually educated in various fields. If you guys really think this is an argument worth having, you should ignore Kraut and put out your own scientific videos so that way at least your errors will be clear and they won't be filtered through the mistakes that Kraut is going to make uh, in your name and supposedly on your behalf with your assistance. Just putting it out there. So anyway, about half an hour into their talk session about uh, my stupidities, I had just finished in my video uh, talking about how in science there aren't absolute certainties. You don't get absolute truth in science. You don't get 100% guaranteed absolutely must be true claims in science. Nothing in science is absolute. And uh, Kraut pauses the video. I'm going to read an excerpt. I'm not going to play the audio because of how flag happy people in Kraut's camp are. Uh, they took down one of JF's videos uh, where he had that information uh, for hate speech because they uh, abused the system because they didn't like the privacy issues. I don't know, whatever that's all about. But anyway, Kraut says, correct me if I'm wrong, it's not likely, you know, more likely, it's repeatability within a controlled environment. That's what it hinges on. Anyway, uh, Sandre says, yeah, I mean, yeah, pretty much. Let me put it this way. I don't know where he gets this from. It's possible to say that something is impossible if I ask a chemist if a hydrogen atom can have four bonds like a carbon atom. That's not a controversial statement to make because no, it really is impossible. It really isn't possible because it doesn't have enough electrons to do that. 
So in respect of Sandre's question of where do I get this from, uh, earlier in that very same video, I put a clip up, an excerpt of a, of a talk that Richard Feynman was giving, talking about science, where he says, science is not in the business of going around proving possible and impossible. Science is only about deciding likely, uh, likelier than this, unlike, unlikelier than that. It's relative likelihoods. Now, Kraut, I know that for you guys, credentials matter a great deal, which is why you want to get some of the hard-hitting credentialed scientists on YouTube, like Thunderfoot and Concordance, to... Uh, give you to feed you a series of uh, sentences that you can reproduce in your video to show that you're right. So I know that credentials matter a great deal. Ask yourself this, Kraut. Do you think you should be listening to a Nobel Prize winning physicist like Richard Feynman, one of the greatest minds in all of physics, or a chemistry student? If credentials are going to matter, I would surely think that the safe bet would be a Richard Feynman, or perhaps a, Steve, a Stephen Hawking or, and Laudanow, <clears throat> who put out a book where they talked about what science is, <clears throat> among other things, it is model-dependent realism that your views of the world are contingent on models of the world. Another way to think about model-dependent realism is true-so-far models. Now, um, Crow, I'm sorry, uh, Sandre, you say uh, that the uh, bonds of the hydrogen atom, like bonds of the carbon atom, that's not a controversial statement to make because no, it really isn't possible. This is not an absolute truth. This is a contingent truth. It depends on the model. You can always, as Sean Carroll will point out to you if you ask him, you can always evade a model by violating its assumptions. You have a model of, in chem you have all kinds of models in, in the sciences, about various uh, natural phenomena. Those models have certain assumptions. And uh, <clears throat> so what you can say is that so far you've not found a hydrogen atom that behaves in a particular way that would disagree with the model that is, is uh, so far not been otherwise shown to be deficient in that regard. You cannot rule out the possibility of finding some hydrogen atom out there that has properties that are inconsistent with your current model. The moment that you say science absolutely can do X, Y, or Z is the moment it stops being science and becomes a dogma. Because what you are saying when you say that I have this model that's absolutely true is that there is no fact, real or imagined, that could ever uh, arise in the future that can, that can uh, contradict the model that I have. You are making a claim to knowledge you simply do not have, and this is a habit of yours. Your ego dramatically outpaces your actual intellectual capacity. Um, so when you say that it is absolutely the case, you're saying that it is a model that can never be revised pending receipt of future information that is inconsistent with it because you are denying that it's even possible for parts of the universe that you haven't yet looked at and hydrogen atoms no one has ever seen to behave in a way that doesn't fit your model. That is a dramatic claim for an inductive enterprise, uh, which is what science is. So you go on. You can make absolute statements in science of possibility and impossibility. That in and of itself is not controversial, except to leading scientists like Hawking, uh, Feynman, Laudanow, Dawkins, any preeminent uh, scholar in science will uh, not agree with uh, Sandre on this point. So apparently, it's non-controversial to the extent that you ask Sandre to tell you what people you haven't asked would tell you if they were asked. I suggest you go find those preeminent scholars, of which uh, Sandre is not among their number, and ask them, because they will tell you Sandre is wrong. Uh, I don't know where he gets it from. The very video I excerpted the clip from that played that you listened to earlier in the very video on which you uh, <laughs> presumably are brainstorming. Property, pr uh, probability itself is hingent, his word, not mine, upon possibility. This is what he keeps missing. <laughs> Let me put it this way. Toss a coin into the air and it comes up heads or tails. It's 50% heads. I'm sorry, 50% tails, 50% heads. Why do you think we can make that 50-50 prediction? I can tell you why, and it's not the reasons that, that you think, Kraut. Uh, Kraut says, because we know with certainty what the two sides of the coin are. Sandre says, exactly. No. Uh, we can know with 100% certainty it isn't going to melt in the air due to the air friction because we know temperature isn't going to be high enough to do that because we know the properties of the metals. No. Um, in algebra classes, when we're teaching high school algebra students algebra, 
we, uh, we give them a certain amount of information at a certain point in time in, in wherever, whatever level they are in at, in their educational uh, career. How, you know, however far they've progressed, they get a certain amount of information, they progress a little further, you give them a little bit more information. Sometimes we deceive them by telling them that they can't do things that they can actually do because as a teaching tool, it's more useful for them to not think about the ways that something can be done when it would only serve to confuse them in trying to uh, get into their mind the things that can actually be done with what they know now. So in order to avoid confusion, we withhold information from them. We will tell them, for example, you cannot take the square root of negative numbers, and then later on we'll tell them that there exist such numbers called imaginary numbers, which allow them to do the thing that they were earlier told that, that just simply cannot be done, uh, because they'll be given a new fact, and they'll be given a new set of rules by which this new space of information uh, becomes available to them in a very stepwise kind of fashion. We do that with undergraduates generally, and mathematicians and statisticians do it with scientists generally. The, the pecking order in, uh, in the natural sciences, you know, this is why I mentioned earlier why mathematicians and physicists sit at the top of the heap and chemistry students don't, it, the prestige of the field depends upon how much mathematics is required in order to get a degree in that field. That's why mathematicians and, ph and physicists are at the top. Below that are like engineers and then chemists and then biologists and you know then you have a whole bunch of the social scientists where all all bets are off. I mean that's some crazy world down there. The <clears throat> amount of mathematics that's required to become a physicist is greater than the amount of mathematics required to get a degree in chemistry, and indeed this is one of the reasons why a lot of chemists are chemists. They look at the, at the mathematics they're going to have to learn, they compare that against the difficulties they've had, and then they decide, well, I don't want to go into that field, it's too mathematically hard. And of the scientists that you have mentioned, that you guys are thinking about going to to get statements, at least one of them does his field precisely because he couldn't do the mathematics that would be required uh, he didn't have the mathematical talent that would be required to do the physics or to be a mathematician. So take a little bit of caution here and just suppose that people in stronger uh, natural science fields or mathematics fields might know a little bit more about the mathematic underpinnings of things than your chemistry student knows or your biologists know. Because uh, it, if you don't uh, heed that caution, you're going to get bitten in the ass uh, in quite a few different ways that neither you nor they are going to see coming, and we're going to get to one of those in just a minute here because this is going to be fun. Anyway, so uh, you claim that uh, you know that if you flip a coin in the air that 100% certainty it isn't going to melt because of air friction or whatever. You don't know that. You are assuming uh, that fact. You are assuming a certain sort of circumstances, uh, a certain sort of conditions that are congenial to the point you want to make. You are confirming your ignorance and trying to prove that you know what you're talking about when you do not. It is not a fact that is known. If you want to say that it's impossible, you have to uh, say something logically, which is to say that uh, to say that it is impossible would, would be to say that the doing of that thing, the occurrence of that event, would entail some kind of contradiction. There is no contradiction at all, whatever, between the proposition a coin is flipped and a coin melts before it lands. Uh, it's entirely possible to have in given a certain set in sort of circumstances, and it's exceedingly unlikely in other circumstances. Um, so, uh, you go on. We have a situation there where we know the possibilities can determine probabilities. The only reason you can have probabilities to begin with is because some things are certain. He really does not understand this. It's fucking hilarious. Let's just imagine for a moment that uh, I, unlike Sandre, and not in the rebellious teenage adolescent stage of my academic career. Let's presume, arguendo, that I'm the adult in the room. I'm one of the adults in the room who knows what I'm talking about, as opposed to the, uh, the braggadocious adolescent who wants to claim to know more than he actually knows, when to the people who actually know what they're talking about, he's really only a, an annoying teenager who hasn't yet learned what he doesn't, uh, hasn't learned enough to know what he doesn't know yet. So I'm going to assert something, believe me or don't believe me, it's completely irrelevant. I'm going to assert that it is uh, entirely possible for an event that has probability zero of occurring, so the probability that uh, an event will occur is zero, can nevertheless occur, and that it's possible to have events that have a probability of one, which means 100%, uh, that uh, can not occur. So, um, whether you believe me or don't, is completely irrelevant because now I'm going to 
show you that this is the case. So let's think about what a probability is. By the way, Sandre, um, there's a reason the mathematicians don't consult chemists on mathematics. We don't go to chemists and say, oh my god, I'm having a really hard math problem. Will you come please teach me some mathematics? But the, uh, the reverse of that happens quite frequently. Chemists often go to mathematicians and ask, please help me. Please educate me on the piece of mathematics I'm mentioning, uh, missing, or the piece of statistics that I'm missing, which will help me refine my model. Or, better yet, uh, do it yourself and then uh, spoon feed it to me in such a way that it's useful. That's how we educate uh, scientists, incidentally. We, just like those algebra students, we withhold certain kinds of knowledge from you because you don't need to know it in order to deal with the things that you're going to have to deal with in your field. It would be nice for you to know it if you want to go independently learn it, fine. But these facts, that these things that are withheld from you uh, are necessary for you to know why what you said is bullshit. And incidentally, on the 50-50 thing, you don't know that the flip of the coin is a 50-50 chance because it's not a 50-50 chance. It is an example that's used in statistics classes for undergraduates to help them get the concept of various kinds of statistical phenomena. Um, we pretend that coin flips are 50-50, uh, when in reality they are not. It is always possible that it can land edge on. But that is a very rare occurrence. It's, it's very unlikely to happen. And since the probability of its occurring is negligible and therefore unlikely to arise in any coin flip you're going to do in a classroom, we pretend that it doesn't exist, exist because it helps us present the material to a student who is still trying to get the basics under his belt in a digestible fashion that doesn't needlessly confuse them. So the probability of an event is the uh, number of outcomes that you're interested in, is what I'm going to call this, the number of outcomes over the sample space. Okay? So, uh, with your coin flip, if you ignore the possibility of it landing edge on, if you pretend that the sample space, there are only two possible ways it can land, then your sample space is two, and then you're asking, what's the, the probability that I will see a given uh, outcome? Well, it's the outcome you're interested in looking for over the sample space. It's a half. Let's think about a six-sided die, a fair die. And it's in the coin flip. You also have to assume that it's a, a fair coin, not just that it has two sides. And uh, so you have to assume, uh, you have to know it has two sides, and you have to make two assumptions, one of which is that it is a fair coin, and the other of which is that it's not going to land edge on. Those are the types of assumptions that we build into it in order to help students navigate their way through material that mankind took thousands of years of ignorance to finally figure out. Okay, so a, uh, I think I said a six-sided die that is fair, and if you assume that it can only land on one of its sides, then your sample space is six. What is the probability that uh, a three will be thrown on average? So the probability is the number of outcome you're looking for, one, over its sample space. All right, that's pretty straightforward. What is the probability that you will see either a 1 or a 3? Well, the number of outcomes for which you're looking is 2. So as the number of outcomes over the sample space, the probability is 1 third. <clears throat> now, let's, uh, let's suppose that we have a random number generator that can generate numbers between 1 and 10. So the sample space is going to be 10, and you want to know what is the probability that one particular number will be will be uh, you know, will show up on it? Uh, well, it's one, one over ten. So the probability that any given number in there will arise is one over ten. Now let's let it vary from one to a hundred. The probability of some given number, the number twenty-nine, for example, is one over a hundred. So it's a hundred. Well, let's let it vary to a, you know, so it's a thousand, one over a thousand, uh, ten thousand, a hundred thousand, a million. I mean, you can just sit here and write you know, zeros until the cows come home. And correspondingly, the P here, this ratio, this represented P here, is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. So eventually, what happens is, is you ask the big question. What happens if we let it vary, say, uh, all the counting numbers? So 1, 2, 3, 4, ad infinitum, to infinity. Your sample space 
is now infinity. What is the probability that any given number will uh, arise, will appear on the display of your random number generator? That probability is zero. So what happens is as you get out, when you're going towards infinity, this value gets closer and closer and closer to zero. Eventually you get so far out that you get a value that is smaller than any possible positive real number and it therefore must be zero because the probabilities can only range from zero to one. So it must be zero. It can't be a negative number and it's smaller than every possible positive real number. That leaves exactly one possibility which is zero and it must be that. Now you can ask the next question. What's the probability that I will get either the number one or the number two? Well, two possible outcomes over infinity. What is that? It's still zero. And you can do this for any proper subset of numbers. So what's the, what, what are the odds that I'll get uh, any number one, one to uh, 10 quadrillion? You know, so I'm looking at what I, I get one or two or three or four and 10 quadrillion numbers long. What the probability? Still zero. But nevertheless, if you push the button to make the random number generator do its thing, a, an event that has probability zero must occur. Because it has to do something. Um, what will never occur is the number zero will be returned. Why? Because the number zero is not in the set of possible outcomes. Why is it that an infinitely improbable event, an event, an event with a probability of zero will occur is precisely because it is a possible outcome in, in the set of possible outcomes. And even though the probability is such that its uh, occurrence is zero, something has to happen. Now, these events are independent, they're identically distributed. Uh, so any number in there that, that arises, that displays on your screen, has a probability of having happened of zero. And nevertheless, there is an infinitely improbable event staring you in the face. Congratulations! You have just seen an event with probability zero happen before your very eyes. And you know what? When you push the button again, another pro event with probability zero is going to happen. Because it has to do something. So contrary to what uh, the grand pronouncements on probability theory that Sandre wants to propose and, and have you believe, uh, it, it, he just doesn't know what he's talking about. For practical reasons, in the real world, scientists deal with, this has a technical name in mathematics, it's called almost certainty. It's where there's, a, there's a, an event that can't be logically excluded, but it has a zero probability, and it nevertheless can occur. That's called uh, almost certainty. Uh, you can't get away from it uh, when you have these infinite infinities running around. Natural science is constrained to the physical universe, which is not infinite. You don't have infinitely many things running around. So for practical purposes, what you can say is that this event is very, very, very unlikely. But you cannot say that it is impossible. Because you don't have the entire system that is modeled. Uh, you always have to leave your models open to the possibility that in the future, some piece of data can be, will be gathered, possibly, which will cause you to revisit your model. You can always escape the consequences of a model by violating its assumptions. Do not listen to Sandre. He does not know of what he speaks. He is a student for a reason. Have a great day.